Next, I'd like to welcome onto stage uh, Peter Baxter, who is the Vice President of EMEA for Autodesk. In case anyone in the audience isn't aware, Autodesk is a software for computer-aided and 3D design. 10 million professionals in 185 countries. Quite impressive. Peter will spotlight for us some of the ways visualization and prototyping is becoming easier and more powerful. And he will speak to the potential of 3D printing. Welcome. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. So I'm an architect. That's my background. I'm passionate about design. And as a company, Autodesk is also passionate about design because we think that actually by providing the right design tools, by encouraging design, we can, we can encourage sustainable innovation. And we're talking today about making the place a better world, and sustainable innovation is actually one of the, the key things that we can, we can affect to help us with that. So Autodesk is a design software company. We produce software for architects, for engineers, and for manufacturers. And in doing that, we're able to influence the way our products perform, the sustainable characteristics of them, et cetera. You know, as a Fortune 1000 company, we, we manufacture software, so our, our carbon footprint is actually pretty light. But where we can have a positive impact is by providing the tools to our 12 million users to enable them to innovate in a sustainable way. And that's clearly where we feel we can add the biggest value. And I'm going to show you some examples of where, of where we're, we're doing that. Sustainable innovation is at the essence of design. When we think about design ch sustainability challenges, we see that as a design challenge. Through the design process, something like 80% of the sustainable <coughs> footprint of a, of a product is embedded in that design at the design stage. Once you've made certain decisions, there's very little you can then do to impact it. So if we can provide the right tools up front to enable people to make more qualified, better decisions, then we were able to deliver a more sustainable and a more innovative product. So we make software for people who make film and games. We make software for people who design buildings and design whole cities and need to not just design but analyze them. And we make software for companies that design products from a small microchip right the way through to, to aircraft or, or car designs. And within that, our customers are forever thinking about ways that they can innovate. And our challenge, as I've said, is to ensure that we can deliver sustainable innovation. But what do we actually mean by innovation? Well, innovation isn't invention. Let's not get the two things confused. It's not about scientific discovery, and it's not about mathematical proof. In short, innovation is about making things better. It's around optimization of a design. It's around changing the, the uh, manufacturing and the design process to produce a fundamentally better product. There's things happening in the market, however, that are four trends that I'm going to talk about, which are absolutely influencing the way design happens and changing the way we think about sustainable innovation. So the first one is what we call business unusual. The cloud and the crowd. You've heard about the cloud computing and its potential to give us access to masses of, of functionality and masses of processing power. But it's also about the crowd. You know, if you want to innovate, large companies typically don't innovate very well. The worst thing they can do is set up an innovation team. They're immediately stifled. The best people at innovating are individuals. But also, let's remember, actually, no one, no one individual is as smart as everyone. So here's an example. For about 10 years, scientists were grappling with a particular problem related to the HIV virus. And then, some time ago, there's a website called Foldit, which is a puzzle website. They posted a problem. Within three weeks, the community that, w that used that site and contributed to that site solved the problem that the eminent scientists had been working on for 10 years. The power of the crowd and the power of the, of the cloud is very, very significant. Also, changing the dynamic about how things are developed. This is a, a, a car by Tesla Motors. You might have seen already the two-seat Tesla car. This is the five-seat saloon, which is going to start shipping to first customers next month. The company was set up by an entrepreneur who had a desire to accelerate the adoption of electric cars. It's actually being set up 
through sponsorship from the US Department of Transportation, through Toyota, and through technology companies such as Autodesk, who provided software for this. Now, that's a very different model to how cars are produced. Normally, it's the big guys that do the innovation or they do the development, and it drops out with the Toyota, Honda, GM badge on it, whatever. But here, it's an independent company, sponsored. It's a Silicon Valley mentality applied to transportation. Very innovative, very significant. So that's the first trend, business unusual. The second trend is digital fabrication. And this is the idea that rather than, this is Industrial Revolution 2.0. The old historical model was to get something to market, you had to produce it at sufficiently low cost, at sufficiently high volumes to make it viable. Produce a very low volume, it typically was very expensive. With digital fabrication, the ability to produce things on demand, you can produce very high quality in low volume and still make a significant profit from it. It can still be economically viable. So what are these machines? What is digital fabrication? It's, it could be an additive thing, a 3D printer. You may already have seen those. They're actually now available for domestic use. They're no longer 300K bits of hardware. It might be subtractive, a CNC milling machine, something that takes a lump of whatever and carves it and molds it and shapes it. It might be about using robotic assembly to, to build in hostile environments or to build to a very precise um, specification. But it might also now be about using biological and nanoscale to address some pretty significant developments in, in the human body. With a 3D printer, we can pretty much now, well, we can print in a whole range of, of, of different materials. We can print in rubber. We can print in plastic. We can even print in metal. This is the Irby. It's a, the, fir, the world's first 3D printed car, designed and constructed by KOR Ecologic in the US. It uses, it, it's printed on demand. Now, it's printed, it's able to be designed to very, precise specification, it's also able to be manufactured with the absolute minimum of wastage because there's no cut-off, there's no off-cuts, there's no things being thrown onto a landfill site. Everything is produced to the exact specification on demand. And this car, it's a hybrid, it will do 200 miles to a gallon. It is very, very significant development and this is the direction that the, the automotive market is going in. Take it to a completely different level, a research team at Harvard University is now producing this nanorobot. It's basically a cell which has been developed to attack a particular form of cancer cell. It's of, of a minute scale, as you would expect. It's basically a clam structure, and basically it will, when it gets its, to its location in the body, the clam opens and it dispatches its payload. In this case, it's, it's a, it's a cancer-killing cell. This is the kind of engineering that's now going on using exactly the same processes. You know, other examples are University of Southern California is now prototyping 3D printed buildings. And you've probably already seen in the press about someone who was fitted with the world's first 3D printed kidney in the US a few months ago. The world is moving on. The third trend, infinite computing. We've always thought about computing as being a precious resource. But actually it isn't. It's actually probably the most ubiquitous resource we've got at our disposal. It's no longer something that's inaccessible and in very limited supply. A typical iPhone has 30,000 times more power than the, than the computer used to launch the space shuttle. You know, there's any number of those kind of metrics. The key thing, though, is computing power is getting cheaper and cheaper while nearly every other asset is getting, is getting more expensive. Put it in very simple terms, Maybe if you needed one computer to do something for 10,000 seconds, that would cost you a dollar. Now with the cloud, of course, you can use 10,000 computers and do the same thing in, in one second, and it costs you the same price. Price is no longer a barrier to access to processing power, and that's really important for the individual innovator as well as the multinational corporation. The fourth trend, prototyping for the future, thinking about digital prototyping. Digital prototyping software allows you to, within a computer model, to start at a conceptual design stage, go all through the detailed design to look at simulation, look at analysis, and, and right the way through the manufacturing process. It links the whole design team together. And what it allows us to do is to build things that were practi practically inconceivable or not economic. This is a, a wave generating power, uh, sorry, a, a power generating wave machine designed by um, 
by Green Ocean Energy, a UK company. It's 50 meters long, it weighs 300 tons. You could not build a physical prototype of that. Using a digital model, we were able to do all the testing and analysis before it went to construction. Similar example in Sweden, Hexicon, floating wind turbines, 400 meter diameter, 480 meter diameter. The success of this project, they're now working with the government of Malta to potentially provide 10% of their energy. Another example in, in Israel, this sits within utility pipes. It's, it's a microgenerator, sits inside a water pipe. It generates its own power for monitoring the performance of the system. It spots leaks. Very, very useful, very innovative in areas where there is no electricity. It's able to uh, deliver a more sustainable water system, manage leaks, minimize wa water wastage, etc. And here from Green Structures, Tom Lipinski is going to speak tomorrow about this. But this is a product called Ventive, and what it is, it's a passive means of controlling the environment within a building. It, it extracts stale, hot air from a building and replaces it with, with fresh air at room temperature, done completely passively without the use of any energy. Using the digital prototyping suite of tools, they're able to minimize and reduce the amount of time needed for things like wind tunnel testing and heat exchange calculations, etc. So what is the role of us as a technology company? Well, frankly, we have the, we have the tools able to, to deliver a lot of this. We have a clean tech partner program. It essentially allows companies like, like your companies to get access to $150,000 of software for $50. And with that, with that clean tech partner program, we're encouraging people to think about sustainable innovation. What we've seen so far is very exciting. We know that's the tip of the iceberg. We know there's a lot more work that we can do. We know there's a lot more exciting developments that the design community can do. And we look forward to continuing that conversation. Thank you. <laughs>